Let's get on to the main event. You've seen the book, and now we're going to hear from the three people who created it. We like to look us up online. Paul <laughs> 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 Bookley is a creator of Penguin Random House and oversees a large staff of exceptionally talented designers and art directors. Working on the jackets and puppies. You really are reading. What about your bio? Tell me this for you. Do you know my bio? Exactly. Working on the jackets and covers of 15 imprints called the Penguin Art Group. That over the past two decades, his iconic design and singular art direction has been showcased on thousands of covers and jackets, winning him many awards and frequent invitations to speak in the United States and abroad. In 2010, he edited and introduced Penguin 75. In 2016, he edited and introduced Classic Penguin cover cover. Next up is Matt V. Matt is a designer and illustrator who attended the School of Visual Arts and Pratt Institute. He has received two gold scholastic awards and created logos for worldwide brands. His work has appeared in the Washington Post, Huffington Post, Slate, Print Magazine, Paste Magazine, and Under Considerations Brand New. He made the book about Penguin's tradition of excellence in book design in the hopes of being included in his history. Uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> also because Paul said, you're doing this. I asked. <laughs> Elizabeth Gaffey is a videographer and would-be designer who works at Penguin. She graduated from Pomona College with distinction in video production and anthropology. She manages the Penguin Art Group social media accounts where she posts photos and animations of Penguin books in addition to assisting on projects for Paul and other art directors and planning excellent departmental celebrations. <laughs> and she helps hold our department together along with Jay Lynn. So. Take it away. Take it away. Um, can you guys in the back hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Carol Waller. Uh, all the fine folks at TDC and A to A. Thank you so much. And of course, all of you guys for, for showing up here tonight. Um, also want to give a shout out to Elder Roeder, uh, the publisher of Penguin Classics, who um, sort of empowers us uh, to do good work. Um, also, I hope you all saw there's, there's more Penguin merch here than there are people. So, and I think that's why the numbers are here tonight. It doesn't do it. They just want the, the damn tote bags. But if you haven't grabbed something, grab something on your way out. Um, okay, so why did we call this talk Painting with James Franco? Because um, we have no shame and because James did a cover for us, which we'll get back to. Um, but that was an illustrated James cover right there. Um, here is James in Williamsburg um, painting a mural for his movie The End, which, which I am you enjoyed it too, right? It was a good movie. I thought it was a good movie. Yes. I'm going to call on you from time to time, so be ready. Um, so this is James Mural. I, I mean, people helped him. He's really, really bad at hands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the hand above Seth. Um, and, and, you know, I poked fun, but actually, I think he did a good cover for us. I love what he wrote in the book. And he does regardless of what any of us want to think, take himself very seriously with art. Sort of love this cover, I think it's kind of brilliant. Um, and this is an interview, uh, a little bit of a back and forth he did with Jerry Saltz, um, where he <coughs> defends you know, sort of who he is in broader culture and, and what he does and why he writes and why he goes to all these classes and why he paints and why he's an actor and um, he sort of takes himself seriously and not seriously at the same time. And I'm assuming most of you probably follow Jerry Saltz. If, if you don't, check him out. He's, he's sort of brilliant. He's the, um, he, and he's, more than he is brilliant, he's, he's super hilarious. And he is the, I think, lead art, the head art critic for uh, New York Magazine. So here are a few paintings from his Fat Animal series. <laughs> You know, say what you will. I, I, I would hang that up. I don't mind it. I like it. I like this even better. I mean, it's kind of, he's kind of funny, you know? I mean, it's like, yeah, he might not get into 
you know, Society of Illustrators annual winner, but it's, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, Seth Rogen seems to be a favorite subject. You know, that's not a bad sketch. It's, it's pretty good. And I don't know, him and Seth really seems to sort of, you know. Anyway, um, so basically, you know, John Siciliano, one of our editors uh, in Penguin Classics, um, asked Franco to do the intro to Herman Hesse's Demian, uh, a book that was important to Franco as, as a young man. Um, and Franco, actually, he, he can write. I think we all love to, to hate the different hats he wears, but he, he can write. And he, he wrote the intro to Demian, and then in a packaging meeting, he brought up, like, okay, we got this Franco thing going on. Um, he paints, should we do the cover with him? Um, and my thought was, dude, I want to see this. You know, I, I want Franco to do this. I want to see what's going to happen. Um, and I think it begs the question, you know, there's all these artists who want to work with people like Penguin. They do it for a living. They're not doing acting on the side. Why the hell are you hiring James Franco, who is really an actor and um, does painting on the side? And some of them are, are good or okay, and some of them are really sort of terrible, like Seth wants it. And <laughs> come on, it's not a good painting. Um, probably because Kanye Seth didn't want to pose more than 30 seconds. I'm sorry, what? You've all seen the Kanye video, right? With yeah, oh, those are great. I love those. <laughs> But you're, you're ruining my punchline. Right there. <laughs> I had a moment there, and it's gone. So but that's my none of us have seen this presentation. Oh, yeah. Yes, we don't know what each other is doing. That's, that's why we're ruining the punchlines here. <laughs> so for those of you, yeah, you called it, um, what did you call it, like a round table, or what did you call a it? terrible idea. <laughs> Record numbers. Um, anyway, so in answer to like Paul shouldn't you be hiring serious artists there are people out there that do this for a living um, my answer to you is we've made worse decisions <laughs> than working with James Franco um, <laughs> yeah I'm looking at you Ramirez Morrissey can go screw himself um, I was so humiliated by this I was well listen it came out of the UK um, <laughs> it was it was a real low moment for Penguin, I believe. Uh, so, it, and I think you know, rightfully, some people rolled in their grave who belong in the classics. Um, now, I know many of you, or some of you, that are misguided, like Jason Ramirez, might be Morrissey fans. So maybe some of you feel he deserves to demand to be put into Penguin Classics um, before the book is even really written, I think. And, you know, I know one person that agrees with you. And... <laughs> Who the fuck does that? What is that? I mean, what? Look at my nipples. Look at my nipples. It's, it's fucked up on every level. Um, so, there you go. The UK made this deal. We just sort of rolled with it. Um, that said, I'm not, you know, Penguin tries to be, with the classics, a lot of them are public domain. So our job is to be the best version of that book you can buy. Otherwise, why are you buying our exp more expensive version? Um, especially if you're a student. So we try to get the best translations we can. We try to get the best forewords we can. Uh, we try to get the best cover art we can because we need to entice you to buy our version. Um, but we're not above things that will bring in publicity. Um, we, 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 we don't mind a little bit of controversy, anything. We, we want to, we're, we're in business to sell books, so we want attention to. So there, there are times where I might put a couple artists on the table for a cover, you know, a couple different people that could do the job well, and we will literally discuss, okay, who's got the bigger Instagram account? I know that sounds horrible, but you know, we're all sort of 
you know, and this makes me sound old because it's been this way a long time now, but it used to be, you know, you hire a book, you do a cover, and publicity rolls out the department. All of us in here, in, in publicity, we all have Instagram accounts, we all have Facebook accounts, our authors are connected to us, they might follow us, they, they friend us. Now you're cetera, on my fun. Huh? I'm not, oh, I didn't know, because we didn't share. We did not share. We didn't share. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it might sound a little cheap, but if there are two people on the table who can do the job equally well, and one of them has 500,000 followers, and we think we can get them to say, you know, put the image of the book up or tweet it or something, that, that might sway us. So with that in mind, you know, I'm not above putting James Franco's name on my book as the very first goddamn name. Um, I'll do that. Um, I will also call this talk Painting with James Franco and work in stuff about James Franco just because you guys probably thought he'd show up or something. Um, anyway, but you know, he did a good job. Here, here are the two paintings he handed in. Um, this one is Ivan, who was uh, a childhood friend of his. And that is, is James at the same time. Now Ivan uh, was getting in trouble all the time. And no one could figure out what was his deal. And eventually later, I, I, um, he was diagnosed uh, with schizophrenia and he jumped to his, his death off a rooftop. And so it's sort of poignant and it, it brings uh, Franco back to Demian, uh, which has some of the similar themes. And then James Thomas, uh, John Thomas, God, I hope you're not John if you're here, I'm sorry. Um, John Thomas put the two paintings together in this way, which I think is all right. And you know, nicely enough, we, we reached out to a lot of people to write for the book. You know, when I, when I was putting this book together, um, I wanted to do it not dissimilar to Penguin 75, which at the time, I, I stand by, I think was a, a sort of a, a novel idea, a new idea, which was, let's not put out just another design book. Here's some books, here's some covers. You can find that online, you don't need to buy a book. Um, it's been done. Um, I wanted to have authors and designers sort of talk about the process of what it went into to making those covers, warts and all. Um, as many of us in this room know, we never get to interact with the authors. There's the filter between the editor and publishers and we sort of hear whether they're unhappy or we hear whether they're, they like it. Or, but we never really sort of hear from them directly. So the job of these two books, between Penguin 75 and Classic Penguin, and also I want to reach a broader audience. I don't want to just sell to the people in this room. I want, not that it happened, but I want like NPR to get interested. I want people who read the New York Times Book Review to get interested because it's about literature and it's about authors as well. So we reached out to a number of people and, 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 and many authors declined and James Franco, who did the foreword for this, was, was nice enough to respond, and he agreed to do it. And he actually did a really, really, really good page. Um, if you buy the book, um, I encourage you to read his page. It's, it's, it's sort of sweet and poignant. Um, so then we have people who you think wouldn't be that complicated, and um, you, you think you've done a, a beautiful job with them. and. You reach out to them, and they want nothing to do with you or the book. And it's the first that you find out that, hey, something went wrong um, during your art direction. And so I'm a huge fan of, of Stewart's. And um, I thought he, you know, he does these paintings that are very much in line uh, with what we're trying to accomplish here in the death of King Arthur. So I reached out to him and asked him to do this cover, which he was sort of all in on. And he did a beautiful job. And, and here's some of his work. I'm not just, I can't state what a big fan of, you know, I just love his work. But you'll see, he uses gold foil a lot. The drops here, the leaves, uh, the background on this, and, you know, the type on this. And so I reach out to him, uh, with an email, you know, sort of the typical email I reached out to most people, hi Stuart, we'd love to get comments from you on the following, the death of King Arthur, 
All I ask is that you make it interesting. Every single piece of commentary is critically important, meaning try to tell a story. We, we want to engage people. And he comes back with, someone redesigned my gold foil layer without running it by me first. It looked shit. He's British. <laughs> fuck illustration and fuck art director. <laughs> I had no idea that there was this divide. Um, so I got back to him and I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I was mean, really proud of that cover. But do let me know if this is your quote. Just not sure where it's coming from. And he didn't respond. He just didn't respond. Like, and, it, and it bugs you when you know when someone's pissed at you. You want to know why? You want to try to fix it. Hopefully, just crickets. And what I love is yesterday I was I was putting this you know the last touches on this talk and I asked Jay. I said, Jay, send me all the emails you have from Stewart. And this was one of them. And I don't even know if I knew at the time he sent this. Um, and I was going to use, if, if he was, if Stewart was open to it, I was going to put, I mean, that's a good quote, I'll take it. I was going to put it in the book. So Jay sends this, Hello, and Jay's my, my assistant. Hello, Stewart. Thanks again for your commentary. We love it. Double exclamation point. Could you just sign, agree to this attached release form to go with your piece? Thank you so much, exclamation point. Jay. Um, and Stewart kind of gets back and he doesn't want anything to do with the book at all. Um, and I reached out to my designer at the time who um, did this foil layer for me. And he's like, I don't know what he's talking about. He sent, you know, a foil layer over uh, that was in half tone. It was all grayed out and it was just, I did the best I could with it. And this is sort of when I translated it into, you know, a... Um, you know, just a layer that we could use as foil, this is what it turned into. So I sort of got back to Stuart and I said, look, I dipped a little deeper in this, and, you know, this is what happened. He, he didn't even respond to me. Um, so, next story. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, actually, that's interesting. Thank you. I'm glad you asked me that. Because it actually worked out because he did not give me any content for the book and because I love this cover I was like fuck that I'm using it. I'm putting this in the book I worked hard on this it's a beautiful cover it is a penguin product as much as it is his I'm putting it in the book uh, and legally we can do that but I wasn't you know gonna drag him through it I just I, I researched Sir Thomas Mallory and, and sort of the cool thing that popped up is even though all these stories are about um, virtue and honor. Um, Sir Thomas Mallory was in jail most of his life, and he was in jail when he wrote this book. And he was in and out of jail for rape, for murder, and for thievery, and he died in jail. So that's probably much better than anyone was going to give me. So that sort of made it. I had my anecdote right there. Um, thank you, Chris. So. On the best day of putting this book together, we got a quote from Jonathan Franzen, which is a really big deal. I probably would have bumped Franco from first place to have Franz in there. Um, and, you know, again, really nice. I mean, he's probably busy, really sweet. And he, he did the uh, introduction for this Edith Wharton book, this gorgeous cover with Richard Gray that Roseanne Sarah so smartly art directed. And here was the uh, quote he gave us. When I first saw the jacket, I found its purples pretty ghastly, and I thought that the drawings played to older Wharton stereotypes and didn't do justice to the three novels' formal originality and their austerely modern, if not modernist, quality. Looking at the jacket now, though, and paying attention to what's actually in the drawings, I mind the design class. <laughs> and then, he, you know, I would have just ran with it, but then he wrote, but you need to tell me if you think the designer's feelings would be in her. <laughs> Um, so Jay, I'm kidding, Jay, <laughs> where are you, Jay? All right, yeah, everyone, I want everyone to know who you are. Okay. Jay of the dot in the I's and crosses the, crossing the T's, sends this to Richard, and like, immediately, Richard's uh, agent, Lisa, sends this email. 
Please can you call me as soon as possible? I have read the accompanying text to Richard's illustration by Jonathan Franz and feel strongly that we not want Richard's work included in the book under these circumstances. Can you please confirm that this will be withdrawn? Happy to discuss, which she was not. <laughs> Best regards, Lisa. So that's it, that's done. Um, beautiful cover, it, you won't find it in the book. Um, and then, on sort of the flip side of that coin, um, you take a book like this where I really, me and the, the artist really, really, really struggled with each other. There was a point where we just were really not getting along. Um, and we reach out to him for the book and I was like, let's talk about that. And he's like, yeah, let's talk about that. So, you know, people are funny. But this is the Kia whose, whose work is just insanely awesome. Um, and what Bakia, oh, before I get into that, we gotta talk about Duomo. Um, before I hired Bakia, um, I had, at the same time I was figuring out what to do with Alice in Wonderland. Actually, it's Alice in Wonderland, two books. Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, all in one book. So, um, Ivan Canu, the, the lovely um, person who runs the, the Me Master College or program over in Milan uh, for illustration students, reached out to me. And he's like, Paul, you know, we want you to come over here. We want you to do a show and tell, sort of like what I'm doing here of your work. Um, but you're not really seeing any of my work tonight. Are you? You're showing work for freelance, right? You want freelance. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> Matt's going to show you his whole portfolio tonight. Um, <laughs> resume. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so Ivan reaches out and he's like, I want you to do a talk. I want you to critique the class. And you know maybe you can give them an assignment. It doesn't have to be a real assignment, but let's you know let's give them an assignment. So I was like, okay, cool. And you know generally, actually I wasn't like okay, cool. Generally I say no to all of this stuff. I don't. I know, neither Ing Su nor I really sort of want to travel for work. We only get so much vacation time a year. So mostly when these things pop up, we say no um, because we can go to Milan by ourselves and and not have to work. Um, not have to run classes. I know it's the wrong attitude, but it's the attitude you have. <laughs> um, so generally it's a no, but we talked about it and we sort of had some visions of Milan. <laughs> and Ing Su was like, let's do it. Um, the good thing about drinking with Ing Su, by the way, is she can't drink. So she'll order a cocktail, but I get both of those. Um, so you should drink with Ing Su. Um, so, you know, also what was in, what, what, which was attractive to me is that they uh, bring folks in to sort of art direct the class and help the students. Really, you know, smart, um, super talented people like Ricardo Vecchio here, um, who have done a good bit of work with and I'm, who I'm just a huge fan of. Um, I don't know what that book is he's holding, but you guys should probably buy it. Um, anyway, um, that's my big push. That's my big push. That's all there is. Um, available on Amazon, and we're fine books are sold. Um, so Ricardo is sort of amazing. He Here's a piece he did for me um, of Arthur Miller. And Ricardo is sort of like somewhere, he, he does fine art, and he, does, he has show, gallery shows, and he's when you work with him, he's sort of somewhere kind of caught in the middle. He, he can do you sketches, um, but you're not completely sure what you're gonna get. And it's more fun to say, Ricardo, do me um, you know, a portrait of Arthur Miller, and what you will get is just a, a shit ton of Arthur Miller portraits. He'll just, you know, this is all one scoop, and one more amazing another, black and white, linear, color. Um, so, it, it really, these, by the way, are um, original illustrations uh, from the original manuscript, which are, are, are sort of awesome. Um, so it really didn't strike me. I, I just wasn't thinking here. You know, if I hire a professional, and it's a complicated project. It's two books, and you have to distill them into one image. Um, if I was to hire a professional, I would give them one or two months to do something like this as with most of you in this room. 
And I didn't even think about the fact that this was students and I gave them two weeks. I mean, I just like, okay, here's the project. They were probably freaking out they were there. And then I went about my life and I was like, it's all going along. Um, and I never thought, <laughs> that's how I go through my, my life. I mean, like, the problems that it causes. I don't think about anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. Anywho. Um, so we go to Milan. And here's some of the work that's being done. You know, a little experimentation here. Uh, I think that's the progress for the progress of that. A lot of rabbit hole stuff. Um, you know, and, and it's 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 none of their fault. And none of these sort of really was a slam home run. It's, it's completely on me. You gave him two weeks. I gave him two weeks. I'm giving you two weeks tomorrow, man. Uh, for every project you have. <laughs> <laughs> but he wants freelance. Uh, and he takes freelance. Um, so, another one falling down. I sort of liked this one. Um, here's uh, Ricardo working with students. And then, you know, I found out when, I, when we got there that they were sort of, I don't know if they were freaked out or just did this. They probably were a little freaked out. But they also opened it up to professional illustrators in Milan, which there are quite a few of them, and this is one of them. Um, I think, you know, it was our first sort of journey together. I've done a couple of things with Milan now, and so has, has Jason. Um, and they're lovely people, and they want to make it work. So they reached out to professionals as well as students. But again, nothing worked. This one I sort of love. Um, Super sweet, but maybe skews a little YA, and um, it's it's sort of young adult. Yeah, young adult. I think everyone here's a bit. Yeah. Um, and then we have this one, which was made to look like an old-fashioned newspaper ad, which I thought was kind of smart. I mean, yeah, obviously they didn't have time to take it much further. Uh, little ruby lift looking thing for you older folks out there. Um, and then me and Ing Su, without, without saying whether we had anything, he's like, yeah, it looks good. And then we jettisoned off to Lake Como, where George Clooney hangs out. We had caviar every day, three times a day, Matt. Um, champagne, baths, the whole thing. Uh, anyway, so then we get back to New York. <laughs> And, you know, the, the process it was not done. The cover still needed to be solved. So enter Bakia. Massive fan of Bakia. Bakia takes these sort of, these amazing characters that he creates, and he puts them in lifelike settings. And he puts them in settings that aren't that amazing, um, but are just every day so that you can sort of see these things in the real world. And it struck me in, in looking at his work, like, my God, what, what better for Alice in Wonderland? She falls down a hole, she enters another you know, universe, she was of the real world. It's like, this is probably what it looked like. Well, not snowy, it's a, but you get the point. So more Bikia stuff, um, really just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff, super smart. Lots of UFOs in his work, really always kind of there in the background. Um, so, I love this one. Scared of the little flower popping up in the snow. It's just it's sort of great. Sort of like Monsters, Inc. Um, so, then we get on to the process. He's sort of excited to work on it. And this is the first sketch he sends. And it's just, yeah, it's like, it's all right. You know, it's just nothing new. So, then he comes back with this one, which is just chock full of characters. And, and you know, it. It takes me a beat, but I realize what I love about his work is it's you know it's like a sole character in, in, a, in a in a situation, and that's sort of what's amazing about it. It's like coming upon Bigfoot or something, you know. It's like a unicorn. So we talk about that, and he you know he he gives me this, which is one thing: the caterpillar on the front, and then Alice on the back, giant, which we all sort of held on to. We liked that part. Um, the leaf was way too tropical. Just, you know, it was fine, but not great. Also, we should talk about type. Um, Bikia is an art director by day. Um, and I have seen some of his type, and I just, I didn't feel it would be right for Alice. So, I mean, as, as I think the book shows, and as I tend to do with the classics, I try to hire for, I don't know, maybe 75% of it, uh, the time, 
people who can do type and illustration. I like and I encourage people to do the whole package. So Bikia was, was very quick to say, Paul, I notice you do this, I want to do the type on this. And you know, he's an art director, so of course he's going to think that way too. He's a designer, he's an illustrator, he wants to do it all. And I do not blame him. And I got back to him and I said, you know, I'm not so sure that's going to work out. I think I want to do the type on this. And he's like, no, I want to do the type on this. <laughs> uh, and, and I said, look, you can try it, but I don't want you to get upset if I do the type on this because I sort of already know what I want to do and I want to do the type on this. I didn't want to say, dude, I don't like your type. And you know, it's like, I, also, I wanted to keep the door open because people can surprise you. I've had plenty of people who is, it was like their virgin entry into doing type and they killed it. Um, so I, I, I was open to keeping that door open, but I also firmly had my foot in the door saying, look, don't be surprised if I do the type on this, which he sort of ignored every time I said so. Um, so then we got this, which I thought was kind of cool. I mean, it's the, um, you know, the card folks with the, I forget, is she a queen or a king? Uh, anyway, um, but it's not quite there. So we push them a little bit, and then we get this, which is really starting to work for us. It's just Cheshire Cat in the tree on the front, and Alice Huge on the back, but I don't like his backgrounds. Um, and this, I think, is a, another failure on my art direction in the sense that I didn't recognize that part of what he does is like, look, the characters are, are, they steal the show. The backgrounds are nothing special because it's like you walked out, you walked in Prospect Park with it, and it's a shot, and then there's this crazy, and then you run into Bigfoot. So he's shooting, he's shooting back. These are, these are mostly his shots, and he was very sort of against um, me saying, hey, how about this? It's a little more exciting, this background, which I, I started to do, um, which started to annoy him. But I was relentless and I wasn't giving up. Um, so I, I started sending, you know, I, I probably sent him 30 backgrounds. This is just a few of what I sent. But, I mean, they're a little more dynamic um, and they would have made a better cover. So finally we settle on this because, you know, to me the Alice books are, are sort of set in sort of an old English wood that went to seed a little bit. And I love this image for that. Uh, and he, he's, you know, and, and, and sort of sometimes dealing with folks from either like Spain or France, I don't know what it is, but I've had problems with illustrators over there where, and cabinet makers too, by the way, <laughs> over there where it's like you send an email and they get back to you a month later and, and, and you're out of time. Really quickly you're out of time. But more than anyone, they seem to want to have back and forth with you a lot. But it's just once a month. But it's like you never really resolve and move on. So he sent this sketch, which um, starting to work. I like it. Cheshire Cat on the front. She's on the back. I'm starting to wonder what's going to fall on the spine, et cetera, et cetera. So we go from here, and he does the finish. I won't bore you with all that stuff. Um, and then he sends it in with his type, which, I mean, it's fine. You know, it, but it's a little Valley of the Dolls. It's a little 1972. It's just, it doesn't interact with the image. I like type it in it. Uh, Type should not be an afterthought. It shouldn't just be plopped on a photo or painting. It should be integrated into, it should all be a whole, which is sort of the reason why I like it when people do the entire piece. So somehow I got the layered file from him and we were way out of time, way out of time. And I did my own type. And this really, really, really upset him which he let me know like a month later, which probably practically after the book went to the printer. And one of the things that pissed him off the most was that the and actually interacting with his illustration. That just, he couldn't, you know, that, he wasn't having that. But it was done, and I was the art director, and he was the illustrator, and that's just the way it is. So I thought he had gotten over it. A couple months later, I get this email. Oh, here's the full. A couple months later, I get this email. Paul, I really do not like your type. I need you to know how upset I am over this. Okay. Um, so I try to diffuse it and I respond to him. Juan, which is, is, is you know, his day name. Juan, it's a beautiful collaboration and package and I think we should both be proud. Thank, for you. Thank you for your beautiful art and I hope you come to love this cover as much as I do. He doesn't respond. I think it's done. A month later, 
Paul, can Penguin offer me the services of a translator? I do not think I am making my dissatisfaction clear in my bad English. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm like, fuck this. I'm not responding. There's nothing I can do. You can't make everyone happy. Just let it go. Ignore it. A month later, I get this email. Paul. <laughs> And within five, and I'm, I'm there, I'm sitting at my desk as this pops up, and within five seconds, I, I respond, no. <laughs> um, and I hope that's it. That was two years ago. I don't know if it's over. But I, I, do, I do think it's over. Uh, but that said, I do love his work, and I think I know how to work with him now, and I would work with him again. He's, he, he is an awesome artist. Um, I would just be like, no, you just need an illustration. That's it. That's all I want. Um, okay, then we get to, um, you know, the trials and tribulations of the interior, but you had to do a cover. And the fun thing about doing a cover for yourself is, you know, no one's going to kill it. It's not like, hey, the author doesn't like it, the agent doesn't like it, I don't have an agent, I'm the author, so to speak. So I can put this on the table and my packaging me in, unless it's sort of abysmal or horrible or it just sort of jumps a shark in some way, they're gonna be like, yeah, okay. So I start playing with stripes, and I think a lot of people think of Penguin as orange, but Penguin Classics are really orange, black and white, that's our trademark dress. So, you know, I start playing with these just sort of stripes, and then I start thinking about the stripes having dimension, things popping up in, in and out of them, and I start to just sort of play with um, this sort of thing, like dragging art from various Penguin classics and how they can sort of interact with the quadrants that I'm setting up or whatever, you know, all these stripes. Um, and then, you know, I bring, this is sort of what I bring to the packaging meeting and, and I show them and they're like, that's great, it's great. So it's done, it's a cover. So I hand it off to Matt V here, who designed the interior of the book, which I have great respect for, he did, he did the interior of the book probably wants to do the cover, but I've been here 27 years, folks. <laughs> Matt was here for like three days. And this was like Three the, years, three years. What, no, two. You ever had three years now? Okay. Um, anyway, you get the point. Um, it's a dictatorship. And I hand it over to him. And I say, Matt, this is a body of work I've been overseeing for five years. I have to do the cover. This is my cover. All I want you to do is, you know, like, some of these details are wrong. Like, you know, the skull is not in the book because that's from the Penguin um, Ink series. And, like, can we get some of the things that are not in the book and swap it out for things that are in the book? And he's like, fine. So then I hand it off to Matt. And, yeah, I think that's it. Now we're going to, now Matt is going to defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great way for you to start this talk. Great. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, thank you, folks. <laughs> I, I will say he made the cover. He did make the cover better. He made it better. It was a hard pill to swallow, but he made it better. <laughs> All right. So that's a great place to start from. Yeah. So Boxing yeah. out of the I corner. Said, okay. You're welcome. Just bear with us for a sec. This is because Matt insisted on making his presentation in Keynote yeah. instead of just a PDF. Yeah, if any of you guys need to leave to go to the bathroom or <laughs> All right. Hey, all right. So, um, hello. <laughs> I'm Matt V, one of the many designers uh, riding Paul Buckley's coattails to success. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to our talk, the name of which was like a shameless clickbait headline, but we sold out, so thank you. Um, Paul mentioned the cover, which, which honestly, I liked his cover and the idea behind it. And from the get-go, I wanted to collaborate with him but that's not how he saw things. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think he told me early on to just let him have this and not to taint the water by showing him any ideas. Yeah, I didn't want to see what you might right. do. Right. Just no clap whatsoever. No, Even though I'm doing the interior, the cover should be a completely like, separate thing, I guess. 
I mean, okay, so here's here's the cover I ended up on, which I didn't think was that far from his. No, because I pushed it to close to not where you started. No, it isn't. It isn't. Uh, I just thought, you know, like the spooky skulls and the zombies in the car down there with the like heavy black and orange. I thought it was a little bit Halloween, just a little. And I just wanted to add, like, brighten it up with some air and some white space and make the penguin more of the focal point in the middle. Um, I did my take on his idea one night, and I somehow worked up the nerve to show him right before he like went on vacation. So this was a great idea by me, I guess. Uh, and you know, in hindsight, it was totally crazy to do this. I'm, I'm working on the interior, and uh, he gives me the cover to tweak and. I said, you know, look, I know this is your one thing, but just hear me out. And <laughs> but you didn't come in with like this cover. You no, I didn't. Like, I brand new covers, <laughs> like those. I did. Yeah. These. Yeah. Like you. Hold on, hold on. Let's let this story straight. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No. You did use the word you're weak. You misremember. <laughs> I, I showed you something similar to this, and I wish I could find the in-between of ours, mine and yours, but... Um, I mean, to backpedal, I had to show, like, some altogether new ideas, because at the time you said it was either something totally new or his cover as is, which I respected, and I... And, but I just... So this is where, after I showed my cover, I went back to the drawing board, and, you know, I'm doing the interior. I didn't get to explore this as, as much as I wanted to, like, no, so, come on, I'm doing the... Anyway. <laughs> I don't think any of you... supposed to explore it. I know, no, it's totally on me. It's We're my fault. Really it's my fault. <laughs> We're finally getting into this it. This is a good idea, wasn't it? <laughs> Group therapy, everyone. Still holding it in. <laughs> I, I really don't think any of these are that great. They're just sketches. And I, I was hoping to collaborate and find an idea that might be better. And um, I thought maybe we could deconstruct the branding in some way and leverage that so that people know right away that it's Penguin. And I'm glad I didn't do the top left one, because that's actually basically the cover for the last book we did in Japan, so that would have been bad. But, um, I mean, I totally get it. 20, 27 years? 27, my friend. Oh, and this man. kid comes in and he thinks he can take this from me. I, I totally exactly. get it. I totally get it. No, I get it. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but in the end, I think the time we spent straying away from the path and showing him those other, I those other ideas that I couldn't really explore, we were able to come back to the cover that I showed with, with fresh eyes, I think, and... Um, Simplified and better. Thank you. I mean, I, I will say that he had plenty of suggestions that made the cover even better. Uh, and I mean, I appreciate you considered it at all, because you didn't have to. Like, Elder, Elder talked about the ledge. Oh, really? Yeah. Thank you, Elda. She couldn't be here. Thank you. No, I... I mean, I really did like Paul's, Paul's cover because... Let's go back. Like, this is his idea. That's why I, I, I offered to take my name off the credit for the cover because I thought, like, it was his... The germ of his idea was this is about the illustration. The design takes a backseat, but it's about all these illustrators that we've worked with over the years, and it's about them. They're the hero. And I wanted to do the same thing with the interior. This is a Roman Muradov. I s swapped in our little penguin. But I just want to walk you through the interior a little bit. We did share the credit. Yeah, we did share it. I showed it. They saw it. <laughs> I'm magnanimous. <laughs> um, I wanted the illustration to be the point every spread. So that's the focus, the cover and interior. I'm going to breeze through these because there's plenty of things to get to. Like buy a copy if you want a longer look. <laughs> that's my big push. Uh, so here's our first section, chapter, Penguin Galaxy. And so we'd be adding or removing blurbs, titles, pages, and covers on the fly up until the last few weeks, I feel like. Yeah, right it was brutal. So the template, which I didn't have, I didn't have a template, I was just sort of working intuitively or whatever, it needed to be flexible. So I wanted the layout to be like fluid or modular, kind of like a website nowadays. 
and to adapt to whatever we might need the spread to do. Um, and by the way, these covers were all fabricated. They were like CGI'd by the, the artists. Like they weren't even printed at the time. So. Yeah, he hired someone in Spain to put these together. Yeah, like we, it was really cart before the horse. We, there were plenty of books in here that weren't even printed yet, and we had to sneak them in. So it's a miracle it happened. But um, so you start start to see like a pattern emerge with the design. I wanted every page to be eye catching. Like when you fan through the book, just like pick it up and flip through it. So I think that's the most I can expect, I guess. And uh, so whether we blow up the art big or let things bleed off the page, like that book spine, I still wanted it, I hope it still like feels cohesive, but still like surprise you every time you turn the page. So like, can you play with the viewer's expectations every time, but still make you feel like you're reading the same book? I mean, I don't know, I tried. So do disagree. Um, I worked with George Bayer, who did the photography. Is he here? He's not here. But a uh, great guy, go-to for book photography. Uh, I think he made it into the book somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, but yeah, this series, the drop caps me for a lot of eye candy. It's like right in the middle of the book. It's the first thing you see if you pick it up. Uh, <laughs> Here's some of the only faces to make it into the boat. Brianna Harden. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Who helped Paul on this endless, grueling, happy, fun, colorful series. <laughs> and also Kristen Half, who's doing like her best Vanna White, I guess. Uh, we talked about, I think Sergio and I talked about it, Paul and I talked about it, looking at all of Paul's many classic series from like every angle. Because like at some point, these, 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 these books are more, they're as much art objects as they are books. Maybe more so. You, just, well, you want it, you, our job is to entice people to let go of a couple extra dollars to buy this version, right. as opposed to a used version they can buy online, or even a new version uh, that, that won't cost this price point. It's for people who are a little older, who have a little pocket money and want you know, take everything in their own computer object to those folks. Right. Um, so, like, they'll end up in your bag, your shopping bag is like fancy gifts. But, you know, maybe once you take it home and it's on your bookshelf, you might reconsider classic literature in a way you hadn't thought to before. Or, you know, like, like a Trojan horse, like we're <laughs> sneaking it into your home. I mean, whatever we got to do to make people read these, please. Uh, Everything in the series that Paul commissions for uh, Penguin Classics is very considered, from the illustrations to the color, down to the matching like painted edges you see here on this rainbow of books. Like, who doesn't want to complete that? It's very OCD, right? Like, you can't just have one, right? Uh, and here, even even the trim size, I thought was pretty considered. I don't know whose idea was that. This is all very cool, like beautiful right. series. We tried to hire Shepard Fire basically said, yeah, if you sort of give me exactly what art you want to use, I'll do that. Greg did it himself. Yeah, no, he, I thought he killed it. And did you guys decide, like, was this a... I think Elda chose that trim series because um, we're all big fans of the great ideas. Right. So that's why these are on the uncoated paper and they're debossed, so like a pillow deboss. Um, great ideas is a Penguin UK classics mm -hmm. series that looks, that has this trim size and debossing. A lot of David Pierce. Right. Before. But I thought, you know, it, it kind of went with the idea that these feel like pamphlets in your hand, which, you know, these are very much about, you know, Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Uh, but yeah, Greg made this work in only black and white on the strength of the graphics alone. And, uh, but a little debossing never hurt. You're probably not seeing it here, but you can really feel it. It's, it feels like, the emboss makes it feel like they're like officially stamped or sealed something to do with government. Um, and so, you probably noticed by now that each series has like an identifiable look. And for the chapter openers, I reduced them down to as few elements as possible, while still being recognizable. 
uh, and you know, so saying each series has a discernible look seems very obvious, but for the idea to have legs for 20, 30, 40 books, like this series does, right? Like, I think it's 45 titles. Okay. That fit, um, yeah, Manuja, while, uh, while we <coughs> killed it, but like, who can do 45 books? Who here, who, who here wants to do 45 books? In, oh, that's like your whole, that's it. That's all you're doing all year. Which is a great gig. She was 22 <laughs> when we hired her. She's probably 25 now. She's still killing it. She was 22 when we hired her, um, which is just sort of an amazing story. The story's in the book, but, um, you know, she's probably 25 now. She's actually on our payroll. Yeah. Um, she's trying to get a killing off of us. Yeah, her lawyer told her that she couldn't do this anymore. It's a green card thing. So we, oh, wow. yeah, we, and, and she contacted me after doing like eight books saying, Paul, oh, this was fun, thanks. And I just lost my shit. I was like, no, you gotta, gotta, you gotta do 45 when you have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> you gotta do 45. Yeah. It's like, no, not that easy. It was like the mom, yeah, it was just not good. But she also sent me an email, I mean, in my defense, she sent me an email, I'm like, well, this is fun, I can't, my lawyer says I can't do it anymore, and, and she sent, like, a frowny face emoji, <laughs> which, when you're 52, like my, I am, and, and, like, you just gave someone 42 covers, and then they walk away with a frowny face emoji, you go batshit crazy. Um, but we figured it out, and we put her on the payroll, and it was kind of funny, because I get um, rosters on my department, on my staff, and, you know, we figure out with HR what their raises are, et cetera, et cetera. And Manuja got a raise this year. <laughs> that is a sweet gig. I had to get back to HR and go, you know, you gave Manuja cost of living wage, and they're like, oh, okay, we'll take that one. Um, I wasn't giving that to Manuja. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think Paul and his team really makes, I mean, how much would you say you work with them on Crafting the series look like was this all her like this, this sort of frame? that's all that's all Manuja. Manuja's a powerhouse. She's a great designer. She's a great illustrator. I mean, I told she has a number of styles. I told her what style I wanted, mm -hmm. and you know, the thinking was Shakespeare is never vector. Let's make it vector. Let's make it just <laughs> as vector as possible. Um, but you know, I just I didn't tell her any more than that, and then she came back with the design. And then we honed it, you know, like with the banner up top. But, I mean, but she was pretty close right out of the bat. And then we picked the three colors for the different. Yeah. You know. But yeah, this is all strongly all in Egypt. And I mean, by the way, I do art direction too sometimes, and I think that's probably yeah. the best advice. Just starting out, just learn what they do best, and kind of just give them just enough guidance to see where they go with it. Because, like you said, they surprise you a lot of the times. And I saw some of these like roughs for the PDFs, and she just went crazy, right? Like, yeah. there was a million she options works, for She everybody. works really hard. I gets lucky with these people, which right? short works with. Um, yeah, there's like 40 of these. Uh, and so, like, talking about, you know, series and templates and all that, Penguin probably has one of the most recognized cover designs of all time. Uh, I mean, like, everyone's seen these before, right? It's like a meme for books, like, Actually, if you if you Google, um, I forget whether it's book cover or paperback, this comes up more than fifty percent of the time. These penguin tri stripes. Yeah. You see them on tote bags. You see, there's the painting in our in our in our lobby that's like working out here. Yeah. Make you look like a book cover. They make you look like this. Uh, but you know, Paul was riffing off this series, or riffing off those to create this series. Well, actually, it was Elda's idea. She oh, said, really? yeah, they came to the meeting and they said, we want to do a tri-stripe series. Um, I think they were probably inspired by um, David Pearson's, maybe his 1980, was it 1984 where he blocked out the type? Right, yeah. Yeah. And that was a big success. And I, I don't know if that was the impetus, but I bet it was. And they came in, they said, we want to do um, 12 titles. Because, you know, the thing is, with the UK does our history so well. They do the retro thing very well. They embrace the history. They plumb it for all that it's worth. And, and they do gorgeous work with it. And I don't want to do that. I want to move it forward. Not that they don't move it forward, but I want to work with all new material. I, I, I feel like they do that, let them do that, and I want to do this. So I was a little hesitant when they put this on the table because it seems a little rehashed to me. So. 
Um, I quickly did a sketch, yeah, which a is that thing on the right where I said, okay, we can do these, but let's do it this way, because I was also working with the cover of Classic Penguin where I was using shapes as, you know, can something be behind it and in front of it so that they're flat, but they have dimension. And that's sort of how we made this be sort of modern and retro penguin at the same time. So our book inspired one of the series. The, the, I was doing both of these covers at the same time. So they sort of, yeah, it, it was sort of an idea that had cool. each other. Um, so another series, Threads. Uh, like these were actually sung, as you can see here. Like yeah, we have them hanging up backwards yes. somewhere, so that you right can there. see, yeah, like what the back of Jillian's and Rachel's um, uh, tapestries, not the right word, embroideries look like. Uh -huh. Like she, she actually made these, like you see up there in the top left, based off of a just like something Paul saw at Etsy, and like the artist said, I'm not going to do these, right? Well, what's the story there? And you just said, you should I, do these? I was, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I was, um, I was trying to solve a Kerouac back, Kerouac backlist series at the same time, and I was trying to solve this. So sometimes when I, you know, I, I bookmark artists, and you know, like Roseanne has a really smart way. She Pinterests artists, uh, not Pinterest. Um, yeah. Yeah, Pinterest. It's so a great Pinterest when she goes way, to her Pinterest page, Pinterest. she sees a visual on each artist and she can just scan down. I'm an idiot and I bookmark the artists that I like and I got and I got like probably a thousand illustrators. So if I'm really serious about a project and I really want to make sure I pick the right artist, I click. And I'm there all night. I'm clicking, looking at <laughs> like, click next, click next, click next. Um, and it's it's painful, but it's my process. And so I was looking really for, um, I had bought this thing on Etsy and I had gone up to Elvin and I said, we should do a series like this and she was on board. So it was in my mind, but I was looking for uh, someone to do the Kerouac, uh, Kerouac backlist titles. Um, and you know, click Jillian Tamaki, okay, let's go look at what she did. And I like to look at people's, um, not just like their professional site, but if they have a blog or just the thing where they put up their day-to-day -day thoughts or processes or sketches, et cetera. And she had on there an embroidered quilt, which was just crazy gorgeous. Um, and I was like, this is it, this is the artist. Because it was really hard to figure out how to get this series done, who could do it with real artistry and just like complexity and just was really gonna bring it. So she had a caption under her um, quilt that said, you know, I did this for myself. Please don't contact me about doing something like this. It just takes two <laughs> And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> so I dropped her an email and I said, you know, here are three titles. Please think about this. We're doing, you know, a series called The Penguin Threads. You're obviously very good at this. Uh, I'll let you pick any title you want if you, if you agree with this. And I had an email waiting for me the next morning. It said, I love this idea, but you've got to let me do all three, which was just amazing. And she did all three in three months. And these are, I mean, she had help. She hired help. Um, and I'm not quite sure how that help worked in what, in what sense. I don't want to paraphrase for her, but it was still, I mean, she, she killed it. She yeah. killed it in three months. She, I don't think she's complaining. She got a gold medal from the Society of Illustrators. She's in this book. Uh, <laughs> I think Jillian is just worried about She's a bigger picture than that. <laughs> of course. But like, uh, we actually embossed the, the the covers so that you can feel each thread and like Paul was saying on the left there you can see like that's the reverse like if you flip her work upside down that's all her work and that's printed on the other side so you, you really feel like you have her the thing she made in your hands um, oh and that that's George that's where George ended up in the book uh, it's his thumb. That's this, is thumb. Rachel, this is Rachel Sumter's work by the way yeah, it's George's big thumb. I do remember him posting on Instagram, right? Photographer, like, posing with his thumb on that page, like, I made it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> is that page? That is a good photo. I think he has a photo This is Paul's horror series. Uh, it's one of the rare times, maybe the only times, that you got to hire yourself as an illustrator. When I was 
when I first started this business, 24, I tried to hire, I mean, I tried to illustrate a bunch of things, and my art director was patient and let me do them and encouraged me. And then, as you become an art director, like, the question is, like, who's the best for this job? And I never was the best for this job. And so this job came along, I was like, I think I can do this. So 25 years in, I, I really I hadn't illustrated anything. And then I did with this, and I, it's all right, I think. There's plenty of people who would have done it a hell of a lot. I mean, I, th I think they sold well, but they're okay, I think, in a way. You can see them hanging over there in the corner after the show. Um, like the original art that he did. Uh, and, and you get this, some behind the scenes on Paul Buckley here in the, in the text. Uh, it's a good read. You check it out. And he's using this, like, long-lost illustration style that your, your father taught you? Yeah, it's called, um, I think, Lost Tempera. And basically what it is is you, you sketch your image. And then on like a heavy watercolor arches paper, you paint white on white. So, you know, generally when you're painting something, you paint the positive, the black parts. On this, you take white tempera paint and you paint the negative areas of your painting. And which is really hard to do because you're painting white on white. The light box helps because you sort of it helps if you have sort of masked out underneath and you sort of paint your white things. And then when that watercolor tempera dries, you take a non-water soluble India ink with a big brush and you coat the entire sheet. And then you take it into the shower or if you have a big kitchen sink and you put it under water and what happens is the tempera, which is water soluble, starts to flake off and then you're left uh, with, this is one of my father's pieces, which is more pure than what I did. Uh, and you're left with something that looks very much like a woodcut. So all of these white areas are what he paints, and none of this black. Um, I cleaned mine up a lot to make them very crisp because I thought I was going to foil stamp them, which we wound up not doing. But yeah, this is it. So you paint white on white, put ink over it, and you put it under the sink, and you're sort of left with this um, sort of faux wood block. So it looks like a woodcut, but it's not a woodcut. You can see it over there. Um, it's a really hard way to do something. <laughs> Paul likes to torture himself. Uh, Christmas classics. So, um, all right. Th this was supposed, to, like, envisioning in my head when I was doing this, it was supposed to be, this chapter was supposed to be this sweet thing about the holidays and family and how Roseanne's father loves Christmas, which he, which he does. Uh, you know, this is his home every year after Thanksgiving. Uh, it's the basement. Yeah. <laughs> But in keeping with the holiday spirit, Paul and Roseanne really go tit for tat on this one. Uh, uh, Roseanne gets to work on these, but, but I'm reading here. Paul Buckley surprises me with some of his own visuals too. Kind of annoying. Why is I he like being you involved? Did to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, right? Uh, he does so many of these. Why can't he let go? <laughs> That's the way it is. I hear Paul's working on creating wrapping paper. Pisses me off. Did you write that? Pisses me off. You do read her. You edited it. <laughs> Give me a chance. Uh, he obviously has a secret love for Christmas. I feel like the Grinch right now. His work is nice, but I refuse to be competitive about wrapping paper. So that, that's, you know, it's supposed to be like this nice thing about Christmas. And so it really feels like spending holidays with the family. Uncle and uh, Uncle Paul and Auntie Roar are fighting. And you have to pick sides. You know, Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, and you know, it doesn't seem fair giving Paul the last word here, but it's his book. Like he Bro, says. you want to come up and speak on this? <laughs> come on, you know you're still pissed about this. <laughs> Group therapy. Uh, Paul tells her, hey, if they like these, you got to let me work on them. Uh, it's about what's That's best for the books, right? Not. Ah, <laughs> oh, let it go. Man. Okay. It's about what's best for the books, right? Ooh, at yeah. least that's how I sleep at night. Yes. These are your words. Well, it makes he, a good copy, though. I'm, so, I'm trying to sell books. <laughs> you know, he goes on in true, like, self-deprecatingly Paul fashion, talking about the meeting where they say things like, oh my god, Roseanne, we love these, and just shoving his work off the table. <laughs> but that happened, right? Well, like, I mean, that happened when you put when we both put our comps down. They just put a hand on mine and sort of went. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these Grinches work things out in the end, and since Roseanne, of course, knows her audience and nails it, Paul admits that if anyone knows Christmas, it's her. And his heart grew three sizes that day. <laughs> and if, if, you look, if you look in the bottom right corner, 
<laughs> like, come on, Paul, it's Christmas. <laughs> Largest publisher in America, and we're putting poop emojis on Christmas. So, great. That's, That's in the book. for you, Ro. Poop emoji. Awesome. Uh, but hey, we got some close-ups of the, the foil, the sparkles, the salt emboss. I got glitter foil. <laughs> got it all. Uh, all right, so deluxe classic classics are like a huge chunk of the book. And more often than not, they tend to be like comic artists. And given how narrative comics are, I thought we would show them, like blow them up as big as they can go, lead off the page, uh, and also help break up the pace of the book. So the only way I could figure out how to do this was to run the, cover, the full cover over like two spreads. So it's like having the book, or at least the cover, in your hand like as you turn the page. So uh, you can see them smaller there and, and on the right for context. I mean, I wasn't going to explain it. Hopefully it's intuitive to the reader. But And since these artists design the covers from the start like as a full package, they often have to come up with or they often like create flaps that come together seamlessly into one scene. So like on the right and left of that, that flap, like, if you put them together, they create this like seamless image. So I'm just running it together like one image. So it's a great way to just break up the book, have big art, just like eye candy. Like the quote continues, like that's the flaps down the left. Maybe it makes sense, I don't know. It, like at the very least it looks cool, I guess. I guess. Uh, but you see it's still there in full context. And you can really get lost in each one of these scenes. It's like, this one's like a, a Where's Waldo almost for Sherlock Holmes. And, and here's another example of why it's good to see the whole cover, because you might not know it from the front alone, but the full title's there on the full cover, Kama Sutra. Uh, and uh, Malika spun these out into a full alphabet, did a show. So. Good on her. Um, okay, so I like this illustrator, but can I embarrass him just a little? Like, hey, I, I don't know. He's, he's Israeli. He might kill you. So, uh, oh, wow. Uh, well, I mean, no. Yeah, no. Actually, I should shut up. <laughs> I'll shut up now. Uh, he did blur. He did a blur for us on this cover, and I'll just show you. But like, I mean, we shouldn't be embarrassed. This is what he sent us to be in the book. I don't remember. For all to said. see. I think some people in the office might know. Oh, yeah, we didn't want to do it. <laughs> I felt that the 90s, 1970s cult title needed a powerful yet naive image to evoke a sense of the sexually liberated female mind. <laughs> okay. An image that could be discovered through double meaning imagery and symbolic use of the zipper and female form together to bring a narrative. All right. When I initially started to sketch that, I realized that the visual of a classic zipper can form the shape and contour of female legs, and on top of that, at the top of the zipper can depict the female vagina using the negative space at the top of the zipper. Like, okay, don't give it all away, Jesus. <laughs> Therefore, when the zipper is open and the legs are open, and then we make that discovery. Like, he's just beating us over the head with it at this point. I like the duality here, the movement and the chain reaction caused by the actions. Colon, comma, zipper, open, equals legs, open, comma, zipper, visual, equal vagina vision. <laughs> So, I mean, he said in the end in his email that we're free to edit it, and believe me, I tried. Because if we didn't fix the, like, if we didn't figure it out, it, it might not have gone in the book. Like, it would have just been an empty page. So, I wanted to get it in there, and like, I tried. It was a challenge, but I, I edited it down and ended up being like one or two sentences because he said the same thing over and over. But in the end, fortunately, our author came in to save the day, Erica John. Uh, but. Man, yeah, Erica John loved that cover. I'm Which glad we didn't end up with that. Yeah. <laughs> Not good. Uh, and, you know, Paul mentioned this one, and I thought I'd just show you. Uh, I would have loved to put this quote in the book, like maybe show his foil layer. Like, maybe you can't read it. This is what I actually wanted to print, just like. <laughs> that would have been like pretty metal, right? Like, that would have been cool. <laughs> like, he wouldn't sign that form. No form, you can't even write. You can't use this right. quote. You can't quote. Uh, that would have been nice. I mean, but we but we niced it up. It's fine. Uh, Paul said some nice things, even though he didn't. He's a great art. I mean, he yeah, he's crazy. He's amazing. You can't take it all No, you can't. Uh, black spines. So, art directing illustrators for classics might be like the most fun projects you can work on. At Penguin, and uh, 
the art director this, and here we quickly realize that Lola, the artist, her collage work was creepier without the demonic horns. It kind of made it goofy. Uh, we wanted it just to be elegant, so that came out nice. Um, there's some sort of weird chance I got in contact with this artist through my girlfriend, who's here in the audience. Uh, it's pretty weird to name drop her in that first email, like, hey, you know how you and Sam went to school together, that one rock concert, remember? Anyway, want to do some work for me and not her? Like, thanks. Uh, here's some of the directions it could have gone in. I really like this guy's station time. Uh, I guess I have to put some of my own work in the book. Uh, it's available for freelance folks. No, I didn't say that. That was Paul Buckley. Uh, with the black spines, I keep trying to limit myself and go for this really simple and graphic thing that I barely pull off. Uh, the concepts at the time seemed really clever, but I, I could not tell you what they mean now. People have, I've heard many interpretations, so I, I guess they work. Uh, uh, I kind of like this one where the lips meet to make the letter A. Uh, those are killed on the left, but I really suppose, I suppose it's done better on the right where if you look closely enough, and this was in the packaging meeting, like if you look, stare long enough, you can see uh, Hester and Pearl hiding in the letters. So that was kind of cool. In the negative space. All right. Uh, Colin Weber art directed this one. Love this illustrator. And we should say that Brianna Harden is doing a, a beautiful job of oh, over yeah. overseeing this series in general. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is one of those as well. She also directed this. It's a triptych of Black Spines, which I thought was just so cool that they thought to do that. Uh, Alright, so this illustrator was one of the like squirrely ones that we wouldn't hear back from. And uh, Jay, our assistant, and I were very persistent. Tenacious, yeah. Ten Tenacious. Tenacious Jay. Uh, <laughs> We were very persistent in getting through to her uh, emails for months, and one day I walk over to his desk and see that he's looked her up on Facebook. Is that normal? Let's do that work? He's creepy in that way. <laughs> and he's, he's, he's like resorted to Facebook chatting her, like he can't hide from social media, and she's apologizing that she missed all her emails. Apparently she caught pneumonia, which is a likely excuse, but not bad enough to get off of Facebook, I guess, so... Uh, Oh, and speaking of Jay, I was trying to find some stuff for this talk, and I was looking for emails from Jay, and this, this is all that would come up. I don't know why there are two of these. Why are there two of these? I think actually I made those, and I made Jay, I, I think I made Jay send them. <laughs> but I think there are two of them, because it limits how many characters you can put in each, and there were a lot of birthdays that month. <laughs> More familiar faces in the audience. Oh, I made those. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, fun J has attached. Good, good try. We're just learning how to like advance search in Outlook. It was like a really major development in putting together this talk. Yeah, so thank you, Outlook. Uh, and quit doing spec work for the author, J. Get paid up front. He's like, what are you saying here? The bag will look great with his gut. He should, he should, I should be his agent. Okay. Uh, Certain TDC board member, <laughs> and, and no context will help any. Don't ask. I don't, I don't even know what. This is just what I'm, I'm seeing. Every, like the night before the talk. That's not even Photoshop. Either. <laughs> I think we wanted to order those chairs for the office. So yeah, like that's call, right. like, It still doesn't help. It's still okay with them. I don't know what's going on. Here. This is a normal day of time. Uh, I mean, I look at this. This is supposed to be Paul on the left. Uh, so we have some hidden talents here at Penguin. Uh, so anyway, like after being basically preggers with this book for like nine months, uh, I'm just relieved we brought it to term at all. Like, I even took like a small fraternity break after it went to the printer. Like, I just had to get out of here. I couldn't stay with this any longer. And, uh, yeah, staring at it every day, I just needed some time away from it. You know, it's about a year later now, so I, I think I can look back at it and say, yeah, it's all right, it's not bad. Like, I'm pretty proud of it, really. Like, uh, seeing the reception of the book has been pretty sur surreal. Like, it actually printed in the New York Times in the Sunday paper. It might be the only physical newspaper that I've ever owned. 
Uh, like seeing my face in the stores was even more unreal. Uh, let alone seeing it here tonight. Like this is all surreal for me. Uh, thank you, TDC, for having us. Um, the social media. Like I, I'm kind of a like social media hermit. Like I, no one can find me. Don't try. So like seeing all this all at once was pretty like. I don't know. It made it feel like it was why I did it. Uh, five stars on Amazon. <laughs> oh yeah, that one idiot. Well, no, hold on. Like, it's, it's aesthetically perfect. I mean, that's clearly untrue. Get off Amazon, mom. Uh, but yeah, no, this is. That's pretty sad. You cannot please everyone. Don't try. It's not worth it. Thanks, mom. Uh, jump the shark. Five stars. Bring it down. <laughs> Uh, they get mad if you're not doing tri strikes anymore. It's like 2017, where's the tri strike? Uh, Paul and Elda, our classics publisher, did an AMA for the book you know, on Reddit. Uh, here, Paul mentioned that it's the best project he's ever gotten to work on. Same year. What, you don't remember? It's no. Right? This is a nightmare. Is this a nightmare? You don't so much that? work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Never again. That's probably what he said last time. Uh, he said it was an opportunity to showcase hard years of hard work that he and others did, and that's really nice, because I, I sort of thought of it as his and Elvis' portfolio. If I could just bring this book around. Like, look, that's Elvis' door. Like, she loves this. Uh, it's the highlight of her week, she says, the packaging name. And uh, again, too nice. He's like trying to summon me like Beetlejuice while I'm on vacation. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. You really don't deserve it. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity though, and I'm really proud of what we made, and I'm sure we'll look back on this time fondly one day, <laughs> eventually, <laughs> and thank you for indulging me. Oh. I just want to say one thing while the industry is here. Um, I get a lot of credit for the graphic classics, and I didn't start them, um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a cornerstone of Penguin. Helen started those. Helen Yentis um, hired, I mean, I don't, were you a designer or were you a junior? You're like a designer. Um, and we gave her one of these, we had been doing Penguin Deluxes, but not in this manner. And we gave her this Penguin Deluxe to do, I gave it to her. And she's like, I really want to get Chris Ware on this. I said, fine, try. Um, and Chris, uh, he accepted it. And then I think a couple days later, he unaccepted it. And if any of you know Helen, Helen gets her way one way or another. She, she called him back and she sort of, I, you said you were almost in tears or something, but you roped him in. And, he did it. And that sort of changed history for us. Because what happened is up to that point, just like any book brief, we gave a brief to someone. And we thought, you know, here's your title, here's your subtitle, here's your author. No one had ever veered from that. We never even considered that somebody might veer from that. And then he handed in this sketch and he had gone flap to flap. It wasn't just the front, it was like flap to flap. He had a cast of characters. He, busted them all out. And very you know, yeah, it's like just crazy awesome. copy all over. And we had an editor at the time in the classics, and I'm not going to give his name, but he was a pain in the ass. I mean, we never got anything good through him. And to the point where one day he literally showed up, um, I think it was at a packaging meeting, he had spent like a thousand bucks or something on four huge catalogs. One was the Fusey, I'm probably saying that wrong. The other was the Louvre, I'm probably saying that wrong. But it was like catalog for major French galleries. I mean, uh, French um, museums of all the fine art you could ever want. He's like, isn't this great? We're done. Hey, we're, you're gonna find all your classics covers in here. So I was sort of fearful. I mean, I loved what Chris had done, but I was sort of fearful when it hit the table and how it was gonna go over for Helen and um, they just passed that thing around and they laughed and they laughed and they laughed and they were just floored um, by the degree of freedom that he took and brought to that cover. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I don't remember whether it was at a meeting or an email, 
our publisher, Catherine Court, Elder wasn't around at that time, said, I want to do a whole series like this, 12 of these. And then me and Helen said about doing these together. But that's sort of how that happened. This, it's, it's on, this story's out there, but I just want to set it straight, since we're doing classics tonight. And I will say, Candide is like one of the covers that got me into doing this, so thank you, Ellen, uh, for my favorites. Uh, I just wanted to show just real quick, here's the classic skew, like on, on this note, here's like some of the crap we had to organize, and thank you, Jay, for helping us on this. And um, I want to introduce uh, Elizabeth Yaffe, who helped me on these. These are the end papers. Uh, it was supposed to be like a penguin yearbook of sorts. And <laughs> we wanted to put names and stuff, but you know, it was like, who do you leave out? Who do you? So we just made it like, instead of just these little narrative, little comic things. Um, it was great bouncing ideas with her. Uh, that's how we came up with a lot of these. Here's like our sketches. And it was great playing toys with her during work, <laughs> work hours. Like I get paid to do that. Pretty cool. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, I wish I had more of these, but these penguins came from all over the company. We got like paper clips, erasers, and then funky ones like salt and pepper shakers, wine bottles. Uh, I mean, it was just like, like drink mixers, a lamp. The people were just coming back from all over the company just <laughs> setting these on my desk saying, remember, like I'm in the cube three yards away and just find find its way back home, hopefully. But like, it really like showed me that everyone who works at Penguin really takes pride in their work. And uh, I don't know of another brain that really draws that sort of audience, that sort of character, that the people that work there. Uh, I'm also really glad we had Elizabeth, because promotion is hard, guys. <laughs> like, usually people that make books then go on tour to promote them, but like, we have to go right back to our day jobs. And, and thankfully, uh, Elizabeth made that part of hers. So she, she sort of like created her own job at Penguin. Like she works with us in administration, but she's kind of part of her own niche, uh, building up the art department's social presence with uh, photography and animation. So just do it, people. Just show up at work and do it. See if people like it. Uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> Paul, if you like, want to talk about a different title, because I made my own job, I like, die a little bit inside every time I hear like that I'm an administrative so. assistant. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, like, we can, talk, on that. we can talk about that later. <laughs> She's for hire. <laughs> really? No. Like, less. <laughs> Matt is, too. I didn't say that. <laughs> Paul did. Um, but so, as Matt mentioned, I run the social media for the department, and I do work in the art department. I'm not actually part of the public but I've always kind of conflicted because it is an Instagram account and like I recognize that that's kind of a silly thing to be like I run an Instagram account like cool um, and so we can all just suspend our disbelief for a minute and like pretend that that's really important uh, but in all seriousness <laughs> in all seriousness Paul was talking about how kind of the classics have become and Matt was talking how they've kind of become less sacrosanct and less revered and I think that social media plays a really big part in that and so in the same way that Paul is willing to put James Franco on like the very top back of his book. Like it, social media works in the same way where it's really about reaching the largest number of people in the easiest way possible. And so the Instagram kind of feeds into that. And like as really silly and as it is on a day-to-day -day basis to be walking around being like, do you have anything related to Paris at your desk? Like trying to photograph a book about Paris. Um, it really lends itself to the kind of immediate and direct feedback that you don't get in the art department where somebody comments being like, oh, I pre-ordered this book. And that's really validating here, and it's not really a relationship that we have. So that's kind of my brief justification of why the Instagram is worth it. <laughs> so it started with an email from Paul to Jay and I that just said, please visit. And <laughs> that's all that it said. And a couple days before, Jay and I got, and kind of told off for starting a birthday party before Paul arrived. So I was like, "Are we in trouble again? Like, what did we do?" And we went into his office, and he was like, "Close the door." And. <laughs> 
Turn the lights out. <laughs> but he said that Madeline, our president, was really kind of looking for each department to build a so social media presence and was either of us. Either of I did not. Yeah, yeah. Was not Madeline. Okay, well, you said it was. <laughs> I just want you to take it serious. Well, I want people to take shit seriously. Oh. Say, Madeline said this. All right, well, now. <laughs> Department's here, so now everybody's aware of that. Uh, but so he told me that Madeline wanted a social media presence for each of the departments, and I kind of jumped at it, which like isn't something kind of that I characteristically do. I generally step back, and if somebody else maybe wants it, I give it to them. But I really I like wanted this, and I think I took it to a place that Paul said when we were planning this talk. He said he wasn't really expecting to kind of take it over. I think he expected something more collaborative. I still have an email that he sent where he sent the password to everybody. And like, guys, the password hasn't changed actually. But he sent an email to everybody saying this was gonna be a collaborative department thing and just keep it clean, but post whatever you want. Um, but I kind of took it over. <laughs> um, but so I kind of took over the Instagram because I really hate filing a lot. And if you ever had a conversation with me, like, it's the bane of my existence. Um, but, so it was just like a nice break from the administrative stuff to be able to kind of do this creative thing and like take this book that my coworkers had designed and really do whatever I wanted with it. Um, but at a point, it like got boring putting plants next to books. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of like, like I ran out of, I, I actually ran out of plants in the front um, And so then I walked around, it got a little more minimal and I was like, do you have any props? Like, do you have a key? <laughs> like, who has a croissant for breakfast? <laughs> um, and then recently I've gotten really lazy and it's just like colorful backgrounds because I can Photoshop that, but don't tell anyone. Um, and then... <laughs> Paul's a really big fan of the Instagram. <laughs> and, like, we've been talking a lot in the department about what a millennial is and what it means to be a millennial. And it's really, like, the most millennial thing I can think of that it, when I started this Instagram, I would like wait for Paul to like the post and it, like not like tell me he enjoyed it, like actually double click on it to be like I like this. Um, so that's like really the most. You make nice comments all the time. You do, and I really appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. But so in an effort to like stop putting plants next to books, I decided to start animating some of the book covers because that's a thing that I learned how to do in school. And so that brings us to. Classic Penguin, where I got this email from Paul that said, E, what's the, he calls me E because one time he told me my name was too long. Um, I think it's rude when people have long names and you gotta spell them out every goddamn time. I, I think he told me that, actually. Um, sometimes he calls me Emily. Your parents were rude. But um, I'll, I'll be sure to let them know. But um, so he said, E, what's the idea for Classic Penguin? Gotta do something good. Comes out 526. And so, okay. Up until this point, my involvement with Classic Penguin, Jay had handled most of it, so my involvement was basically ordering paper for Matt, because he was printing a lot. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, he needed to print those full-size spreads, so we ordered a lot of really big paper. And we got this email from Paul. We heard a lot about his trip to Indiana, um, and it just says, for vacation, may I suggest Indiana? That's because Indiana was where he went for his press check, and when Paul and Matt and I sat down to try and plan this talk, Paul was kind of like, we have to be serious, and Matt and I were like, we just want to tell anecdotes the whole time. Like, that's what people want to hear. And Paul was like, what kind of anecdotes do you have? Like, there aren't any anecdotes. And we were like, well, Indiana. And he was like, all right, I've got 45 minutes. So <laughs> you can ask him about that later. Apparently, there was a lot of fried chicken. There's no food in Indiana. <laughs> KFC six times, right? KFC, yeah. I went, I, went, I, I went to KFC a second night in a row. And I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. That's okay. Um, <laughs> Indiana is, this part of Indiana where I went was really, really, really blue collar. It was corn country. It's, it's definitely like corn syrup country. Um, and the only car that had GPS, because I had to get from the airport to the plant, uh, was a BMW Roadster, which was amazing. I, I looked like a complete idiot. Everyone, <laughs> slicker. Yeah, no, I, I, that's what I looked like. I looked, I looked like a complete jackass. Um, everyone was in trucks. Everyone was like seriously hardcore blue collar. It's like at the end of the night when I'd leave this horrible place, um, I would go try to find food, and the only and I try to eat healthy, and the only 
thing about... You haven't had carbs in six weeks. I haven't time. had carbs or sugar in six weeks. Um, actually, I'm drinking wine tonight, which is the first time. Oh, it's just not doing so. Anyway, um, but that's... All right. So, so I, I, I go there and I didn't know how to use the car, so I, I went too far past the speaker and I couldn't back it up, so I had to get out of the car and go over to the speaker to order my food. And then the next night I came around and there's just this creepy looking guy in the dark, because it's late, in the darkness. And he's like got a box cutter and he's or a big knife and he's cutting up boxes. Oh. And I, I pull up and he's he's like five feet away from me. He's like, hey! And I just went. <laughs> I was like, hi. I remember you from last night. You know, it's just like because that's all there was to eat. I remember when I saw an apple to eat bees finally in the distance. It was like God parted the clouds. <laughs> all right. It's horrible. And you all also have to ask him about the hotel that Jay booked him in, but that's for after, right? Um, all right. So Paula sent me this email. You got to do something good. And so just so we're all on the same page, what I actually ended up doing was this. And. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of how I made it, but the process for how I made this one really wasn't very different for the process of any other animation that I've done for the book covers. So, but this was a fun one because there's just so many different elements. And like Matt kind of talked about, it's really about highlighting the illustrators and their different work. So that was kind of where I ended up. And as I've done more of these, I've kind of realized that there are two types. They're the kind of animations that really draw directly from the design of the book, like this one, which is for one of the Shakespeare classics. And if you notice my like stellar file naming here, it's just called Shakespeare. It really doesn't matter which of the Shakespeare's it is. It really just matters. The design is what matters. but something more like this one, which I think Colin worked on, which is the Penguin Book of the, Ar of the Undead. It's really the content of the book that informs the animation. And like if this were a field of flowers and it were doing the same thing, it wouldn't have quite the same effect because the book is really this creepy thing. And so for this one, there were so many pieces that it really made sense to kind of play between both of those elements. And of course, saying that there are only these two kinds is simplifying it, but, um, but there were just so many different bits to work with on this one that it made for a, a fun challenge. And so this was kind of where I started before I even touched a computer, and I remade this for the presentation, but it was really a balance between making something that felt organic and natural but also understanding that like the horse and like number seven, the horse in the top right isn't gonna float up from the bottom, it's gonna kind of arc in from the right. And the cat, because of its shape, is gonna roll in. And then my favorite part of this animation, which I'll get back to, is that the Cheshire cat fades in. And this is also where I decided to do that little history of the penguin logo at the end. And so the first thing I did was I took Matt's file, which when I asked him for the file, <laughs> we sat next to each other and I was like, Matt, can I have this file? And he was like, sure, but like, I'll tell you, it's really a mess. And so I opened it and he tried to really blame it on the intern, who I guess had done a lot of the silhouetting, but it was a mess. And so the first thing I did was I flattened it into the bits that would move and the bits that wouldn't move. Because when the, when the bits that don't move are static, it's just easier to have it as a background layer. And then I made the little mini animation of the different penguin logos through the years that flipped through. And they accelerate. And the idea behind that was really that this was a history of penguin. And so it made sense to acknowledge that history in the end of the animation. Because whenever I do one of these, it's nice to do something at the end that kind of acknowledges that it's the end, that says that like, it's over. And a lot of these is a lot of a lot of these animations are also working backwards because you have this cover and you know where it has to end up and you kind of have to work back to get to the beginning. So
And so this was just kind of like a little making of that I put together. And I start with all of the different pieces, and they all come in. And it's really about working through the timing of this, and then I crop it. And then I like to put it on a background, because when you put it on a background, it feels more fantastical than if you just had this kind of this thing existing on its own. And when it's in a background, like it's not something that would exist to have this flat lay of books with this one cover moving. And so then once I photograph this, I take out the book, put the animation in the back. And it's important that the animation goes in the back, because if it goes on top, then the edges don't look as real. Yep. And then I straighten it and clean it up a bit. And then for this one, I added a kind of this complication of zooming in on the different illustrators, because again, it's really about focusing on each of them. And so it was this kind of play between the timing of like, like I really struggled getting these guys to come in with enough time to get down to this corner. And then I post it. Play it again. Encore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it just plays through the whole thing once. There's the cat fading in. And about the cat, I remember I posted this one right before lunch because I was kind of rushing to get it up and then we all went out to lunch and people started to see it because they were checking their Instagrams during lunch and whatever. And they were like, cool animation. And I was like, awesome, but did you see the cat? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, uh, no, like whatever. And I was like, but like, look, the cat, it fades in. That's so like Cheshire cat, that's what it does. <laughs> and they were kind of like, okay, whatever. <laughs> And I remember that it was so validating because when Elda, the publisher, came down to do, I think they came down to do the radio tour because who knew you can do a cross-country radio tour from Paul's office in one afternoon. Um, so Elda came down to do the radio tour and she stopped by my desk to tell me that she really enjoyed the animation. And as she was walking away, she was like, and I love the cat. And I was like, you're awesome, I love you. <laughs> like, well done. <laughs> And Paul also liked it, because I got this email that says, killer vid, E. We need more, and a plan to roll that out. Maybe a, maybe a spread once a week, tagging the artist, introduce, etc. With the subject, visit, please. You never know with those emails. Yeah, and so we've really, we had really like come a long way by this point, because a year ago I had gotten this email, which was, boy, tell me again how to tag a photo. <laughs> I'm old. What do you got to do? So I didn't, I didn't include my, my reply, but I like put a really detailed like step by step of how to tag a photo. And like I know I've made fun of you here, Paul, but right. you have a lot of fans. <laughs> <laughs> and like really, I'm one of them. Like thank you so much because I couldn't. Like it's so nice to be able to come in and kind of do whatever I want. Um, and so when Paul and Matt and I were meeting to figure out what to do for this presentation, Paul was like, now you know, if you want to, but no pressure, like only if you want to, if you wanted to make something new for this talk to finish it off, like that would really dazzle everyone. And so I'm here to dazzle you. But um, also, Paul, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Is that more? <laughs> 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 